Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Yuan, and I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Second State. Uh, we do software performance engineering. Welcome to my talk. This is my home office in Austin, Texas during the pandemic. And uh, um, I hope you enjoy this talk, and I hope we can meet in person soon. So let me start sharing my screen first. Let me move myself to the corner. Okay, so here we go. Well, um, the, the topic of this talk is performance engineering for application developers, especially web application developers. So when this topic came up, um, a lot of people ask why, you know, because um, for, for many years, the, the, the main challenge of web application is not performance. That is very evident with the rise of frameworks like first with Java and with Ruby on Rails and with no, JavaScript on Node.js. You know, those, all those frameworks are not known for their performance. They are known for their productivity, developer productivity, ease of use, and all those other features, safety, and all those other features, just not performance, right? And uh, uh, over time, they get optimized a lot. But when they first came out, um, most people would say those are slow languages. When Java first came out, it's definitely a slow language. It has a reputation for that, right? When Ruby first came out, when JavaScript was first used on a server, it's the same reaction. And people typically have two answers to that. Um, the first answer is what we call the Bill Gates answer, is to say, um, yes, I know it's kind of slow, but um, technology evolves so fast. So in three, four months, you know, it'd be fast enough. Oh, well, that's actually the answer Bill Gates gave when people uh, criticized that the Windows software is too bloated. He basically said, um, the CPU of a computer is evolving so fast. So what's slow today is not going to be slow tomorrow. So why spend all this time, you know, optimizing things that are gonna improve on itself, right? Why wouldn't you spend time that's uh, optimized for user experience and uh, features and other things that are that gonna have long-term value, which I thought it worked really well for them or for him and for Microsoft, right? You know, the second argument is oh, you know, I'm just writing a web application. You know, that's the application. All the application does is babysitting a database. You know, so someone come in a request, I go to the database and fetch the answer back to them. You know, that's uh, that use case. It doesn't need a whole lot of performance, so to speak, right? You know, so that's, that'd be the second answer. You know, I don't need it. The first answer is going to improve by itself. The first, the second answer is I don't need it. But I think things has changed in the past couple of years that forced us, you know, for, I has forced the entire industry to have an entirely different look at this whole problem. So I referred to an article that published on the journal Science only a couple of months ago. It was our top computer scientists published this article. And uh, from the title of this article, you can get a hint, you know, there's plenty of room at the top, the top in you know, the top of the stack, right? Because 40 years ago, Intel's Gordon Moore wrote an article called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. The bottom of the stack is what? Is the hardware, the CPU. What he meant, what Dr. Moore meant, is the CPU and hardware are going to continue to improve at a rapid pace. So everything else is going to lift with the tide, right? You know, so you don't need to spend a lot of time optimizing software. You can spend a lot of time optimizing software in terms of its developer productivity, the human productivity, not the computer productivity, because what's slow today is going to be fast enough three months from now. So that's what we refer to as more slow. And that's basically driven the productivity improvement in the entire computer industry for the, well, for the past 40 years. So that's essentially the first argument I just gave, right? You know, is that, yes, it is slow, but it's going to improve. However, this article talks about the more slow has really has stopped. As we all know, you know, the computers and hardware are not really getting faster. You know, the clock speed is definitely not getting faster. It's uh, um, the, the, the size of the transistor has, you know, has gone down from say, you know, 10, you know, has gone down a little, but not a lot, right? You know, so the, the way to get it faster is to do like GPU or add more cores to do more parallel computing and you know things of that nature. It's not the the raw performance is improving. It's uh, you get you you throw more compute you throw more computers at the same problem, right? So you know so that's uh, perhaps that's one of the biggest challenges that's uh, um, that's the developers today are gonna face. That's did not did not really exist in the past forty years. That's a completely new 
problem that people are going to have. And then there will be the second problem is to say, OK, yeah, it's maybe not getting any faster. But you know, all I do is database. You know, that's primarily limited by the network bandwidth and hardware and you know, hard disk speed. You know, that's, um, um, you know, and if there's more requests, I can just open more servers. You know, there has been a lot of study in terms of server, a horizontal scalability of those services. So we can do sharding and we can do a lot of things. So, you know, that's, so why performance is so important? Well, that is because um, another thing happened in the past five years when more law stopped is on the software side, we have figured out how to utilize more and more computing power, especially with the emergence of say uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning. And all those applications require a huge amount of computing power that is previously not available. And uh, in order to incorporate those features into your application or into a web application that you are building, that is not just database, you would actually need to care about performance. You know, you, um, as we'll see later in this talk, there's a huge difference in terms of the software stack you choose versus the performance you're going to get. So here is the um, the the um, uh, figure one in this uh, in the science paper, right? You know, so how do you, how do we? So hardware has stopped improving, but the demand for computing power has gone up. What's the solution? So the leading computer scientists give us the answer. You know, they said there's plenty of room at the top, meaning today's software stack has a lot of inefficiencies that we can squeeze out by doing software performance engineering. I just said, you know, that's what my company does, right? You know, that's why I'm giving this talk, right? So it's removing the software bloat and tailoring software to hardware. You know, we have new hardware that's designed for specific problems, like for deep learning and for, you know, for things like that, or even for, for, you know, for, for Bitcoin and for blockchain, you know, there's special hardware being developed for that. And to tailor software for that, not just to have generic software that's designed for CPU to access those hardware. So by combining those, if you read this paper, you know, the, the, the paper show, uh, you know, a Python program by rewriting it instead of Rx, uh, C++ and running on custom hard, uh, hardware, you can get a performance gain of four orders of magnitude. That's over 10,000 times performance improvement. So that's actually also is something that um, we have seen routinely by, um, you know, when people have a web application that, that does database stuff, they don't do AI because not because they don't want to, but because they can't, you know, because the software stack is not efficient enough to support this type of computer intensive applications. And by changing the software stack, we would be able to squeeze a lot more performance without changing the underlying hot, the CPU. We may need customized. Sorry. We may need customized software. We may need customized hardware to be in a mix, but not more CPU, more CPU power because CPU power is not improving anymore. So let's see a, a case study or example in action. Okay. So the the goal here is to create a cloud application that runs TensorFlow inference on an image. That's uh, you know. I think that's the use case a lot of people have considered, right? You know, that's, I have a web, web service or web application that would take an image and then run a TensorFlow model. There's literally hundreds of thousands of TensorFlow models trained for different purposes. On those images, on this image to do things like facial recognition or object classification, you know, anything you can think of. You know, so this is a typical use case, run TensorFlow inference on an image. So depending on the software stack that we use, so if we implement this TensorFlow um, inference metrics on say JavaScript and, the, and even run this JavaScript in a very efficient uh, runtime. So for instance, in the WebAssembly runtime in V8, in the interpreted mode, you know, meaning the JavaScript running as the way it's supposed to, you know, as the way it's designed, you know, as a scripting language. We are looking at 10 minutes of time on a state of, state of art CPU to process a single image. Okay, 10 minutes. That's clearly too long for web application. You know, it's may okay, it may be okay for say a asynchronous function of the service that you need to, you know, it's asynchronous. So 
there's plenty of time on the back end to process those things. But 10 minutes for waiting is clearly not good enough for web applications. So now we rewrite it in TensorFlow.js in just in time web assembly. You know, so that's a different, that's not in the interpreter mode, but TensorFlow.js is TensorFlow's C library cross compiled into JavaScript or WebAssembly through, uh, through the EMCC compiler. And uh, it runs in the V8 WebAssembly with the, with the just-in-time compiler optimization. That speed up significantly because that allows the application to be compiled and run instead of being, being just being interpreted. That's creates, that alone creates 500 times performance gain. You know, it's reduced from 10 minutes to around two seconds. You know, two seconds, I think it's pretty, it's, it, it's fairly acceptable for web application now, right? You know, that's uh, because the, the, the time you need to, um, to, uh, to do the network transmission and all that is, is in order of seconds. So two seconds is probably good enough for the single interaction like this. However, if we optimize our WebAssembly stack, it's not even go to native, but, go, but do WebAssembly with ahead of time optimization. For instance, you know, the SSVM called Second State VM is a WebAssembly, open source WebAssembly implementation that we have. To, to run the same application, you can get to half a second, which is four time performance improvement again. You know, that's half a second, I think is, is very acceptable to, to um, you know, to most, I would say interactive web applications, right? But you can, you can optimize it even further by giving it custom hardware like GPU and then have the, um, have the compiler optimize for, optimize instructions for GPU, you can get another 10 times performance gain. So it now goes to 0.05 seconds or less per image. If you think about that, that pretty much allows you to process real-time video data because we, real-time video data is about 30 frames per second, right? If you want to recognize every single face on every frame of a video image, of, of a video stream, you can more or less use this now. You know, that's, uh, um, you know, you, can you do 30 seconds per, uh, 30 frames per second? May not, but you certainly have the capability to do. You know, that's, um, but you can sample it to do like um, once per, you know, once, you know, do one, one recognition for every three frames, you know, something like that, right? You know, so to do that, that's, that type of performance allow us to actually do streaming video and the run AI application on top of it. Then of course you can have full native, meaning that you don't use WebAssembly at all, that you just write um, the um, code in C, C++ and then run on bare, bare metal C, GPUs. And that would cause it to be even less, even more performant. You know, that would be under 0.05 seconds. That's, um, so that's the range of things that we can see, you know. So we can see from, you know, from JavaScript being interpreted JavaScript to, the, uh, to um, pre-compiled WebAssembly. That is basically in the same family of technologies because WebAssembly evolves from JavaScript, right? You know, same family of technologies, and we already got four orders of magnitude improvement in performance. So that means that I agree with the science authors. You know, there's plenty of room at the top. And in this talk, I want to give you some, um, you know, real examples and tips in terms of how to optimize for your own application. Right? All right. So. That's the thing, you know, it's uh, um, there's a saying to say there's it's turtles all the way down the world is what is the world being built on? You know, as we, as we have looked at, we have just mentioned, you know, things like JavaScript on Node.js when it first came out, people say the performance is not good enough. You know, that's um, you guys really need to improve performance. So fine, let's improve performance. And uh, now most people who use Node.js would think it performs pretty well. You know, that's, uh, that is because Node.js fundamentally is not a JavaScript framework. It is a JavaScript runtime that build on a C++ engine. So the Google V8 is completely written in C++. And most of the common tasks you use in Node.js, like the file system operation, like the image resizing, 
And you know, those, those computer intensive tasks, they are all written in native modules in C++. It's just providing a JavaScript as the interface for developers. So what we would argue is Node.js achieved high performance today, not because it's a JavaScript perform plan runtime, it's despite its use of JavaScript. It's most of the heavy lifting is done by native code, native machine code in C and C++. The same thing happened in Python. You know, if you do um, heavyweight machine learning and uh, AI applications, you often use Python to write your, um, your, your application. But you are only writing using Python as an interface. So all your Python calls actually get translated into native modules. They run it natively in OpenCV and in TensorFlow. All those libraries and modules are written in C++ and compiled to machine code. So the trend is become very clear here, you know, is that we need something for developer productivity, you know, JavaScript, Node.js, Python. But on the other side of the things, we need something that is high performance, which is translate everything into native binary code. And for most applications that application developer develop, they sit in the middle, you know, so if you write a complex Node.js application, a lot of your logic can be executed in JavaScript. And some of them, you know, like, um, you know, image resizing or file operating, so like, like the things I just mentioned, would have gained from the high performance of the native modules. But the more application logic you have in your, in your application, the more business logic you have in your application, the more JavaScript you're going to use. And the more JavaScript you're going to use, it's slower it goes. So for most application developers, it's a balance between those two, right? You know, that's for very simple applications, I can achieve really high performance because most of, because mostly all I do is to call the native, to call the APIs in Node.js that get translated into native, native function calls. But as my application grow more complex, as I'm an enterprise developer, you know, if 80% of my logic is actually building JavaScript that has no corresponding native library, then you can expect the application to run pretty slow. So that's, I think that's one of the challenges that, um, you know, um, more and more developers are, are finding out, you know, is to say um, Node.js or Python is, um, is, is really performant if you follow the tutorials. But if you write a ton of your own code, then performance engineering become a really big problem, right? You know, so that's a problem that's, um, we think, well, you know, at least I think, would be more of a more problem for, for future developers. So because of all that, you know, that's, um, we have seen, you know, the Moore's law is not, is not holding and uh, the demand for performance is great. And uh, um, by having choosing different frameworks, you can achieve vastly different performance results. And most of the frameworks today actually go with the route of having a high level interface and then have to do the actual computing as native code, right? So that's how we define great performance is to follow the lead of what Node.js and what Python has done in the past. You know, is that on the performance side, we're gonna have one requirement is it should be as fast as a native library, you know? So it's, um, so if we come up with a new framework in Node.js that does high performance, we say high performance computing, it should make the JavaScript application you write as fast as fast as the native library of the of the Node.js API calls, right? You know, so that's uh, so on the speed side, that's the only requirement that we have. However, on the other side, which is the software engineering side, there's lots of other requirements that uh, the framework must must be able to satisfy in order for developers to use it, because in the end, I can. You know, if, if, if speed is all that matters, then I can write everything in C++ and people are not doing it and people will not do it because there's the native binary have all kinds of problems. We need other things that's um, other benefits of software engineering that has happened in the past, let's say 25 or 30 years since Java came along, right? You know, the, the, the safety and the security of the runtime, the portability of the software so that I can compile it on my Mac and then run on Linux Right, I don't have, I don't need to have the exact same machine um, on my development environment and on the deployment environment. And I can move it around in different deployment environments. I can manage it, I can allocate a resource to it. And I can tell, you know, I, I, I can say which, which resources that have access to it and which is not. I can stop it, I can restart it, 
I can move it to another machine, you know, all kinds of all those things the IT, the, the, the IT folks would want. The new framework would need to be able to integrate with existing ecosystems. You, know, you can't have something that is brand new because you know the learning curve of something like that would be really sharp and it takes 10 years for say Ruby on Rails to get popular, right? And also for Node.js. So you know, so so something to get a developer mind share, you also need to have it to integrate with a large existing ecosystem. And it needs to have high developer productivity. We are looking to squeeze performance from the top, but it's not in the way that is crude, that is only optimized for the machine. And we also want to make it so that we preserve the, the software engineering gains that we achieved through the past uh, 30 or 40 years, right? You know, so that we want, uh, the, way, uh, the way we do it is to native performance but with all those nice features that managed languages or managed runtimes that gave us. So is there, that sounds like a wish list, right? You know, and I think um, Node.js and Python have achieved some balance of it. That's precisely why they're successful. But I also, but I also mentioned their shortcoming is that if you write, that's, um, they, they provide API for that, but they don't have a way for, for they don't have the flexibility for developers to write, say, arbitrary JavaScript or Python applications and achieve the same performance as their native API provides. So what's our answer? Well, so the first thing we need to really think about is choosing a battle of programming languages, right? You know, so if you we want to write high performance applications, like the, the science paper also alluded to. The software blows start with our choice of programming languages. I, I, I frequently refer to C, C++ as the most efficient, but not for everyone, because of all this, um, the safety and the portability and other things that we described. And here is a table of the performance of different languages and the, you know, in terms of execution time and the memory it takes for the wrong time. And you see, you know, some languages are, like, like Python, it's very, very slow and Java, takes a huge amount of memory at runtime. C, C++ is probably would be, can be used as a benchmark. You know, they are, they are small and efficient. And what's the second come? It's Rust, right? Rust is a very popular programming language. It's, uh, well, it's, um, it's popular as a C, C++ replacement because it provides a lot of the high level programming language features to C, C and C++. It can make far more productive to write safe code and secure code in Rust than in C++. And because of that, um, it is a fast growing programming language. And it's also one of, um, it's um, I think five years in a row, it's, it's the most beloved programming language by um, you know, the Stack Overflow survey. So I think Rust would be a pretty good language to choose to, to, uh, to write high performance applications that can run inside environments like Node.js. Do you agree? So that's um, that's my assessment. And if you don't agree, that's um, you know email me or you know get in touch because this um, talking about which programming language is better is a holy war, right? You know, is that uh, everybody has their own opinion? It's just my opinion. I, I like Rust. That's why I'm giving a talk here, right? So, however, how do we run Rust code on the web? You know, so there's there's the old way. You know, is I think that's the predominant way that people do it now. Is to do um, is to write it as a as a native module. You know, so I create a web web server that is has a native module, right? You know, this could be Node.js, could be Apache, could be a lot of things, and it's just write or, or have a, a web server that is written in Rust so that it can execute Rust application logic behind the HTTP interface. Right? You know, so there are a lot of projects that's done this way. And um, they have seen a lot, uh, a huge performance gain over other approaches like Node.js using JavaScript, right? Um, however, the problem with that is the problem we have mentioned. It has to run full native code. It's not friendly to the cloud providers. It's not even friendly to the IT department because people cannot really audit the, the native code. And even if you are completely trustworthy yourself, you say, my code has no bugs and uh, um, have the, and it has no security problem whatsoever. But most of those code depend on third party libraries and those libraries might have problems. So running native code is always um, uh, an issue for big organizations. So that's, um, 
in my opinion, that's what hinders the, the adoption of Rust in bigger enterprise at this moment, right? Because the need to run things in, in native, and even with containers, it's not completely safe, and it has, um, you know, it has all kinds of issues, which we're going to talk about in, in a minute. So a better way is really to compare it to a managed bytecode, the, 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 the approach that Java has pioneered 20 years ago, right? You know, so to compile it into a bytecode and run inside the managed VM, give it a lot of benefits. And this VM today, is the, the leading choice of this VM is WebAssembly. So here's the co-founder of Docker. He said this last year, you know, <laughs> WebAssembly on the server is the future of computing. He even went on to say that if WebAssembly and uh, what the WebAssembly system interface has existed in 2008, they would not have invented Docker, right? You know, that is how important it is. It's a, it's a new high-level container that allows us to run um, bytecode that compiled from a highly efficient programming language. So that's something that we have not seen in a long time in computing in, in, in this industry. So I think that's what's most exciting about it. So the benefit of the WebAssembly VM, I think uh, we have touched those points, many of those points early on in my slides. So the first, of course, is security because provide a sandbox. It protects from yourself and protects from all the dependencies your application has so that you don't have to run them at native. And it also provides something called capability-based security. It's, it's a part of the manageability, um, e manageability issue. It allows you, when you start up the VM, you can specify which um, file system directory it has access to, which environmental variables it has access to. So it's, you can have an independent security policy that, independ that e independent from the operating system itself. Right, so security is a big draw for running um, Rust compiled high efficiency code in, in, in a WebAssembly VM. So, but of course, all this is not even an issue if it's not fast, right? You know, so WebAssembly has to meet the, because we are talking about high performance computing, it has to meet the requirements that is can run at close to native speed, you know, so bytecode running in WebAssembly should be almost as fast as bytecode compiled to the machine binary. As we will see in a minute, that is actually true, which is um, maybe surprising to a lot of people. Of course, runtime safety is related to um, security. It's to say when an application crashes, it should not affect other applications that are running in the same system. You know, Docker gives you some of that, but we're gonna talk about uh, the problem with Docker in a minute is, is mostly related to performance. And the portability platform independence is also a big draw, is that I can write my application on a development machine and uh, I, I can run Windows or Mac or whatever. And then this same application can be executed in a cloud provider. I don't even need to know what the operating system the cloud provider is using and what standard libraries uh, it has. Right? So it's platform independence is a big draw. And the manageability, we, we just talk about that. It can be moved around. It can, you can allocate a resource to it. And uh, you know those nice features that the VM can give you. Okay. So here's a graph that's a study that we did um, for WebAssembly, Web assembly especially, um, you know, we, we use the second state VM as an example. Uh, where's the stalker? So those are execution times. So the shorter the bar, the better, right? You know, the shorter the bar, meaning the, the, the smaller amount of time it takes to accomplish the task. Um, at the bottom two benchmarks, the NOP and CatSync, are um, startup times and file system performance. One thing that really stands out is that um, Node.js isn't that bad. You know, when compared with Docker native and Docker Node.js running the same application, Node.js is only about 100% times slower than, than, than the native application. You know, that's, um, that is, of course, because, you know, all those standard benchmarks are actually being optimized in Node.js. So if you just want to do a numer uh, number crunch, you know, because th those are essentially all number crunch, you know, that's, um, you are calculating the, the binary tree, you know, three-body problem, and, you know, things, n-body problem, and, you know, things like that. Um, those are number crunching. And the, uh, those things are very heavily optimized in the Node.js um, V8 runtime. So 
they, they are, when the JavaScript runtime engine sees something like that, it actually knows how to build the very efficient uh, machine native code to, to actually execute those. So that's why it's, I would say, you know, in a, in a, um, in a realistic benchmark, the Node.js is going to be 10 times or maybe even 100 times slower than the native code if you run everything in interpret JavaScript mode. But for because the benchmark is structured, it's actually not that bad. It's uh, it's only twice twice as slow. So, but what's really really surprising is in almost all cases, the WebAssembly runtime, meaning the bytecode, the Rust code compiled to bytecode and then run inside the the safe sandbox VM, is actually faster than it's running in Docker plus native code. So. I think many people challenge this results. You know, we, we, we have shown this result to two different people. You know, that's, um, we can talk about that in a minute. And people challenge this result to say, how is that possible? That is, uh, that doesn't sound possible because the machine code, even with Docker, because Docker has very minimal overhead, the machine code should definitely be faster than running inside a sandbox. That is because the way um, the, the virtual machine technology has evolved over the past I would say 20 years, pioneered by Java, is the AOT compilation, you know, the head of time compilation. So when when the VM sees this um, WebAssembly bytecode, the first thing it does is to compile it to machine code and then run it. The, in the process of compiling to machine code, it can have many different optimization options that is not available when you compile it to Docker plus native. When you compile a, a Rust or C++ application to full native application, you actually get, um, you specify a set of, you know, compiler optimization flags that's depend on, that is fairly generic, that it depends on your guess of the operating system, of the target system. So for instance, you're going to say it's an Intel processor, it has, you know, it has, well, yeah, so it's an x86, processor and uh, come uh, and optimize for that right but for SSVM and WebAssembly knows exactly the type of machine it's running on. it knows it's an Intel processor or AMD processor it knows how much memory it has so it can intelligently choose the compilation flags that make it run faster you know because all this is done dynamic at runtime not at a compile time anymore the compile time you just generate the intermediate bytecode right so that uh, allows the, the web assembly to have even higher performance than native code. So, you know, that's one of our requirements is uh, as fast as native uh, machine code, right? But you can see from those benchmarks, the web assembly bytecode with the AOT compilation is actually better, you know, in terms of compiled bytecode. That's um, a, a very surprising result. And because uh, because of this, this result that we, um, that we wrote an article that is peer reviewed, that is already accepted, um, for publication in IEEE software. It's going to come out this year. You know, it's called the lightweight design for serverless function as a service. It compares um, the second state VM against uh, leading serverless containers, including Docker, uh, Amazon, Fire, uh, Amazon Firecracker, and uh, the Google's GVisor plus Docker. You know, um, so this is a research paper that's, that's already peer reviewed and accepted. And if you, um, um, if you want to uh, a preprint of it, let me know, and I'll send you one. So that's, um, but that's the surprise result is that WebAssembly provides safety and better performance. You know, you don't have to com compromise between safety developer productivity against the native code performance. That you can actually do both. You know, so that's that's a big takeaway from this paper and maybe from this talk as well. So I'll skip this. So. So let's look at the application architecture. That's um, that's a typical um, web Rust WebAssembly based application would run inside Node.js. Right? So on the front end, there will be the Node.js JavaScript runtime, and so developers can write things in JavaScript as they as they want to, because that's that's proven again and again. Developers want to write their application, you know, most of their application in JavaScript. And when it comes in, the runtime figures out the 
what the application is actually doing. If the, actual, the application is making native function, is making Node.js function calls, it's typically dedicated to the C++ based module library so that it can go on and uh, get the, the, and execute it as native binary. But as we said, the native binary is all nice if it's audited and if it's safe, but a lot of them are not unless it's come prepackaged with Node.js to install third-party native libraries, it's always a challenge. So for the other computational intensive tasks, it could, opti uh, it could optionally route it into a WebAssembly runtime and run it inside WebAssembly and uh, get the result returned back to, to JavaScript. So for instance, this could be a whole, it could be a complete task of image recognition or face recognition. So WebAssembly, the Node.js runtime just pass the image and the model to the WebAssembly runtime and it would do file system access, you know, um, access the GPU and do all that stuff, do all that magic. Then, and this particular WebAssembly code, WebAssembly virtual machine code is compiled from a Rust program. So for developers, they write two pieces of software. One is the JavaScript um, application that handles the web related stuff. And then the JavaScript application calls APIs Part of the API is the Rust application the developer has written and the compiled WebAssembly. So we're going to show a very concrete example in a minute. So let's just, um, you know, um, um, and there's also a link. If you are interested, you can go to that website and see, you know, that's um, how exactly different components of this system can work together. All right. So now let, let's look at the demo, you know, that's um, uh, AI as a service. Um, Go to this website, secondstate.io slash fast. What is fast? It's not fast, it's fast. You know, it's a function as a service. It's a web assembly based function as a service. So let me switch my screen share to, to this website. All right, so here we go. So that's um, the web page. It's our, you know, it has demo spotlight and, and scroll all the way down. It, it has a lot of tutorials and the code, which we, we're gonna see as an example in a minute. So let's go to do uh, face recognition. It's, it goes to an application that we wrote to say detect faces. And this application, I think it represents the future, meaning that's, it is a completely static application. There's no server here. It's just, uh, we can put it anywhere in GitHub pages or any static or even host it locally. And what it does, it's, um, it's make a request to a serverless function that uh, the serverless function is written in WebAssembly, written in Rust and compiled WebAssembly. And the serverless function would uh, process the request in Ajax and then come back to this web page. So, this, so all you need is a service where you can deploy a web, WebAssembly function and pay for each invocation there's no need to stand up a server that's 24 seven to process the report, to process image upload and all that stuff. So let's do how it works. You know, so you choose a file, you choose an image, and of course you can do a lot more. And then you say, find faces. What it does is that takes the image, it's, um, it's make, makes a web services call, it goes to the, goes to the fast, the function of the service. The function of service executes the, the web assembly function and uh, mark up first detect all the image all the faces on that image and then draw um, those green boxes around each face and then generate the return image and the return the image back to our browser so that we can see the result so this fully interactive application you don't it's available 24 7 but you don't need to start a server and pay for the server to make it available Right, so you can come here and use that at any time. And we are, you know, as um, um, you know, as a host of, of this service, I'm not paying anything. I'm only paying for each request, right? You know, so for all the time it's idle, it's um, it does not generate any billing for me. 
So um, some of you might recognize, you know, this is a Nobel Prize season, and this is a 20, uh, 1927 Solway conference. It's probably the most famous uh, conference in the history of science. And there's 29 faces here. Uh, you may recognize some, you know, most people would recognize Albert Einstein in here, but 19 of those people, 19 of the 29 people later get, got Nobel Prize, and some of them got twice, like, you know, um, uh, Madame Curie, she got twice, right? You know, so so this is um, perhaps uh, the the greatest mind in modern history, and uh, you know that's we submit the image, and the computer run a TensorFlow model and detect all the faces, and then came back. You know, very simple, and uh, uh, you spend most of the time uploading the image and getting it back and rendered in the browser, right? You know, that's um, the the actual time to do image recognition on the server is under one second. Is you know, it's a couple hundred milliseconds at this point, and we can we also we can optimize it a lot more. You know, but I just want to show you this example. And then let's see another example. The image classification, for instance. That's also another very popular TensorFlow model. That I choose an image and I say, I already knew it's a dog, so I want to classify it. You know, to see um, it runs a TensorFlow model. To say it runs a TensorFlow model to uh, to to uh, try to detect what is on that image and then give the confidence of that, right? You know, so in this case, it doesn't return an image back, it returns a JSON string. So it's, um, it looks up its, um, its, its, uh, its object classification table and said it's a pug, which, is, which it is. And it's, uh, it knows it has a very high confidence, right? You know, so this whole process, take, uh, again, on the server, it takes you know, several milliseconds. And most of the time it takes, it actually goes to, um, you know, get the image and, and this, um, you know, um, Submit to the server and then come back. And in all this time, um, I don't need to pay anything. You know, as a as a um, you know, as a service provider, I don't need to pay anything because I have no server. You know, I just have a bunch of HTML, and then I have a function of the service sitting somewhere. And someone hits it, I'll pay a fraction of a cent to it, but I don't pay for all the idle time. That's, so that's high performance computing plus the new billing model that gives us a lot of flexibility, right? So let's go back to our site. All right, here we go. So we have just seen an example of AI as a service. I, I welcome you to go to that website and play it with yourself and then see all the source code. It's all on GitHub, you know, that you can see all of them and, 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 and then see how, you know, but we'll walk through one of the, um, one of the source code in, in the remainder of this talk so that you know how it works. Uh, this is the demo. And the architecture of this thing is, um, we have just described the overall architecture, but let, let me dive a little deep, deeper into it to see how it works. So on the Node.js, it's a JavaScript app for the web, the network, and the database tasks. That's, um, that's handled by function and the service. So that's out of the question here. So what we start is the Rust source code. It's the function itself. The function gets the input from the, um, from the service, which is the image that the user uploaded. And it does all the heavy lifting of the image processing, you know, resize it to the right mount, to the right size, uh, select the TensorFlow model and pass the image and TensorFlow model to TensorFlow. And then get, after the result come back, it does the fun, things like drawing the boxes around faces and then generates the JSON and figure, makes sense what the, what the result is. And then get the result back. So it's the uh, heavy lifting is all done in the Rust source code and it's compiled into WebAssembly and executed in WebAssembly. And then the actual TensorFlow work is actually done through an interface called uh, what we call the a a TensorFlow WASI or the AI WASI system interface. So because this is um, fairly standard um, system command that requires the full native functionality, you know, it's not. Um, it doesn't really make sense to run inside WebAssembly because it's so standard, right? You know, that's, um, um, you know, there's very little chance that anyone would be able to uh, make it unsafe or, or, or you know, that's, uh, um, so 
so, so all the benefit of WebAssembly is not here, but to make a standard interface in the Rust API so that developer can call TensorFlow has tremendous value for developer productivity, right? So we have a native, uh, a native wrapper of the TensorFlow command that can be invoked from WebAssembly. So WebAssembly runs, on the uh, runs inside the, the, um, the function of the service that it's a process or the application logic that when it says when, when it encounters the task that needs to do to TensorFlow, it passes off to the native command. Native command executes that and returns back into WebAssembly. WebAssembly process all this again and then return back to Node.js and then give it back to us. So that's the whole process of the of the application. So the node Node.js code, again, it's very simple. It's just to take the image and return it. And the, what's important is the Rust and WebAssembly code. And as we see, this is the uh, um, meat of the application. This is why you need to write application logic in, Web, in, in Rust and WebAssembly, because each of these steps is going to be very slow if you just write them in, in, in JavaScript. And so the first is you load the image that the user has gave you, has uploaded, and you resize it to the model that TensorFlow demands, right? You know, so for image recognition, TensorFlow demands 224 by 224 image size with uh, RPG um, values for each pixel. So, so you resize whatever the, the format you get the image from, the JPG, JPEG, or PNG, or whatever. You normalize it and format, format it into that particular format the TensorFlow can accept. And then you load the model data. You select which TensorFlow model you want to run against this, model, this, this, particular, um, this particular image, right? Is that face detection or is that um, is that face recognition or is that object detection? So you choose the model data and choose the uh, data that is associated with the model. So for instance, in this particular example, it's image, it's object classification. But all TensorFlow give back a numbers and you have to map the number into um, the actual words for the object, like a dog or a cat or you know, uniform or whatever. So that's um, so you need a label file and we read the label file that go with the model here as well. Then step number four is to actually execute the TensorFlow model, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. And once we execute the TensorFlow model, it gives back a bunch of numbers. It's gives back an array of tensors, right? you know, so forth. That's, that's what tensor is. You know, that's a fun fact, you know, that's um, the, the, ten, the tensor was popularized by Albert Einstein, which we saw in last picture because he needs that for general relativity. You know, so now we are using TensorFlow to recognize a picture of Albert, Albert Einstein. So that's, well, anyway, just something I, I thought it'd be interesting to mention. So in, in number five, we have the uh, command return value as, as um, floating numbers. And then we look up the table to map those numbers and the probabilities into the objects or the images that they have. If we do face recognition, we would load the image again and draw those circles using Rust and WebAssembly to do it in a way that it's high performance, much high performance than any JavaScript library can ever achieve, and then send the result back to us. So that is uh, um, what we call, you know, um, in, our, in our way of doing that, what we call high performance function. You know, it's a function that's written in Rust and the compiled WebAssembly so that it can run at full native speed. And uh, it's have access to the operating system or to other system resources that can can make it run even faster, right? You know, that's for instance, in TensorFlow, we don't have to rewrite TensorFlow in Rust. We just make a system call from the WebAssembly runtime that shows the the um, you know how flexible the WebAssembly runtime is. On one end, it integrates with JavaScript. On the other end, it integrates with the native operating system. So number four, we you know step number four we, we left out is what we call WASI for TensorFlow. WASI is you know WebAssembly system interface. It's commonly defined as how to use WebAssembly to access system resources like the file system, the sockets, random number generator, the clock, and you know things like that. But we can use WASI to access any command that's available on the system. In this case, we have the system installed um, TensorFlow command, so we use WASI to access this command. By having WebAssembly security, we can actually, at the time of, um, you know, when we initialize the WebAssembly runtime, we can say which command you have access to. 
so that it has no unpredictable behavior. Maybe this this particular um, maybe this um, maybe this particular instance can only have a particular kind of TensorFlow model, and uh, and not others. That we can we can specify this all when we start up the the WebAssembly runtime. So that's why we say WebAssembly is more secure and more manageable than native applications. Right here's an example right here. So to execute this TensorFlow model via command, we specify which model, which family of model it is. We just selected a model file, right? But we also need to tell it what's the structure of the model. And so there's different command for that. And we, we, in this particular case, it's MobileNet version two. And then we give it arguments. So the input, so the, the, the tensor name in this model for the input argument is called input. And the argument for the output is softmax. Um, and the size of the image that the model expects is 224 by 224. And after that, we load the, we load the, um, the model data and the image data into the command so that the command runs the model against the image. So the actual execution of this command is actually in one line. It's command.output. It's called the command. It's called the command suwazi. And then the results come back. And uh, we package the result into a JSON string, and then we have then the the the, the Rust and the WebAssembly application continues to process this and return this value. So that's the whole application. You know, that's the application is just a single function that's written in Rust and does most of the work um, in the compiled WebAssembly. But when it does needs um, the um, you know the help from the operating system or from the system installed command like TensorFlow, it calls out to uh, a well-defined and that can be um, a well-defined interface that can be secured. So that's that's our application. You know, so as you can see, you know, that's um, one of the works that we do is that we try to make as many types of TensorFlow models available in our, in our ecosystem, right? You know, so um, this is all open source. So there's many family of TensorFlow models that we can incorporate into uh, as Rust APIs, right? You know, we just have shown you there's a, a mobile net Rust API that calls the mobile net family of um, uh, TensorFlow models and each and the mobile net family of TensorFlow models has, you know, I think hundreds, if not thousands of models that people train, you know, to recognize different things. You know, you can have a, mod, very, a model that is very specifically to recognize uh, different types of docs, or you have a model that they recognize different objects on your, on, your, on your desk, you know, something like that, right? You know, so there's a lot of ways that you can have different models. And so we would like to have an um, have a open source project like the TensorFlow model zoo, but it's TensorFlow model zoo for WebAssembly, right? You know, so to have those models being prepackaged and made available to uh, open source projects, so that anyone in that using Rust and WebAssembly to write those high performance applications would be able to use those models um, by just installing them um, through their compiler. You know, so that's um, um, if you are interested in this initiative, you can go to the link here. You know, it's a uh, um, um, second state AI as a service native model zoo. So that's. So here are some resources to get you started. There's a guide, um, there's um, tutorials and documentation, and there's, um, again, this is a link to the FAST. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for, um, for um, attending my talk and uh, um, I hope I, I, I'll see you in the community as, um, um, you know, reach out to me if you have questions, comments, or want to criticize our approach, you know, we work on all comments. And uh, just go to our website and find our contact information. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you later.